Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a review of a fragrance from the house of Arige La Dore. And what's very interesting is if, you, if you've if you been keeping up with my Arige La Dore playlist, you know that whenever I reviewed, I believe it was Russian Musk, uh, I said, unfortunately, this is the last Arige La Dore full bottle I have that I have not reviewed. Turns out that is not true because there's an entire collection that I have full bottles of that I have not reviewed. And in fact, nobody really has reviewed, uh, at least giving an individual review to. So this is sort of a YouTube exclusive, if you will. Although I've done multiple live streams on this and I've reviewed others from this particular collection. So today we're gonna talk about the History of Oud collection. Uh, probably one of the best Oud collections ever, as far as I'm con personally concerned. And today we're gonna talk about the history of Bengal Oud. Now, you can see the color of the juice. Um, you guys have seen this presentation before, but I absolutely love the presentation with the Arige La Dore mark on the bottom, and of course the detailing on the cap, and the detailing on the atomizer. Beautiful presentation. You can see the color of the juice. I'll read you the little blurb on the history of uh, Bengal Oud, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I've reviewed two from this collection so far, the history of Chinese Oud and the history of Indian Oud. Um, and those two are probably my favorites, the history of Indian Oud and the history of Chinese Oud. Both of those I actually like more than the history of Bengal Oud, but this is still a really good fragrance. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the whole point of the collection and get into sort of the details of what I get from this composition. But first, uh, let me read you the little blurb on the inside. So on, this is a magnetic box that it sort of sits in. Kind of a cool little idea here. Um, and inside there's a quick write-up. So it says, this perfume composition consists of extremely rare, 100% pure and wild Bengal Oud oil distilled by East Bengal Agar Company. The approximate date of the distillation is the year 2000. So this is a little bit of a vintage oil. Highest quality farmed sinking oud chips were also provided by East Bengal Agarco. Its vapors were infused by Russian Adam into the top notes of this perfume. Okay, so before we go any further, let me just sort of explain what this means. So the oud itself that's used is a wild Bengal oud, all right? So that means it's not from a plantation, it's not farmed. The oud chips that were um, infused into the top notes by Russian Adam were actually uh, oud chips that were farmed. So they were a plantation oud that was used. So there's two parts to this composition. And actually the whole line itself, the whole idea of this line is to take something which, and you can see sort of the, um, this is the inspiration for this bottle. See how these sort of come to a point? Uh, there's little oud, there's others like this as well, but see how the bottle sort of comes to a point. If you've ever got real oud, uh, many, and this is the cheaper version, but many times it comes in a fancier, you know, sort of glass thing. This is a plastic one. For example, this is Chinese CO2. So these are the actual oud, and you can see how thick it is. You can turn it upside down, it's not going to run. It's like molasses, right? And sometimes with the actual oud, what, what ends up happening is, um, what ends up happening is that you swipe it on your skin because it's extremely concentrated, thick oil, right? And so you swipe it on your skin, and what ends up happening is it takes hours for everything to sort of go through the breakdown, the composition, you know, the uh, top notes to sort of let itself go, get in more into the base. And, and oud does transition and change like a perfume. Many people don't realize that, but it absolutely does. So Adam's whole idea with this collection was to take some oud, put it in perfumer's alcohol, and that way it unlocks more of the sort of, uh, it, you can you can go through the process and enjoy the top notes and how it breaks down, more like a perfume. You don't have to wait long amounts of time like you do with the oil itself. And of course, he also infused some of the um, sinking oud chips into the top so that you got some of the smoke from the oud as well. This is a fragrance that comes across as very smoky and um, woody, of course. Uh, but the smoke comes out into the dry down of this perfume. So even though he's infusing it into the top, there is a little bit of smoke in the top. 
But what's so interesting about this fragrance is there's hints of Russian Adams previous releases as well, even though this is just an oud, right? And so when I'm talking about his previous releases, like I want you to imagine something like this. All right, so this is the original uh, Russian oud, which is very sought after nowadays. They actually just released a Russian oud part two in the new classics collection, which I just got my samples yesterday. So I'll do a live stream on the classics collection one of these days and test those and talk about them, and that'll be a really fun live stream. Um, but if you know sort of Russian Adam's work with things like Russian Oud, or if you know things like Oud Zen, these are compositions. These are entire fragrance compositions that are made um, by Russian Adam, including real Oud. So obviously there is real Oud inside of the composition, but there's more than just Oud in, in these perfumes. This is, like I said, Oud Zen or Russian Oud. These are really made to, um, these are made more like a perfume composition. There's other things in here. There's sandalwood. There is um, uh, vetivers. There is civets and castoriums and myrrh and all of these different ingredients, right? Um, labdanum, stuff like that, right? In the compositions. In the History of Oud collection, most of them, Kinam has maybe one or two extra notes added, but most of them, it's just Oud. There's nothing else in here. It's just Oud uh, with the perfumer's alcohol, right? And so this is the connoisseur, the Oud connoisseur's collection, if you will. This is kind of one of those uh, collections where if you're someone that really wants to study Oud, and because I was gifted such a beautiful gift by Russian Adam uh, within the last year or so, it really made me want to pull the trigger on the whole collection here because I realized that when Russian Adam says things like, Oud is at the actual, a absolute top of the totem pole, understand exactly where he's coming from once I started smelling some of these compositions of just Oud. You wouldn't think Oud could be so complex. So that's the first thing that I want to mention is that when I'm talking about some of these different notes and stuff like that in something like the history of Bengal Oud, there are no other notes in here. There is no vetiver. There is no sandalwood. There is no myrrh. There is no labdanum. There is no florals. But the fragrance can sometimes shift and feel slightly floral or resinous or balsamic or, you know, it might feel like there's a little bit of a green vetiver touch or synthetic, you know, or not synthetic, but uh, castorium or civet or something like that, right? It could feel like it has those things in there, even though it doesn't. So everything emanates from the oud. That's the first thing to keep in mind when you are uh, talking about the history of oud collection. Everything we're talking about feels like the oud. So when you first spray, and by the way, I've got a nine hour dry down here and I've got about a three hour dry down here, okay? So I've, this is actually the second time I've given this a full wear, um, and I've worn this to bed multiple times as well, but um, second time I've given it a full wear. So I sort of have a good breakdown on the composition. So here's what you get. Whenever you first spray, in the first few seconds, what it smells like, and it took me a while to put my finger on it, but this fragrance changes a lot in the first 30 seconds or so. The first 30 seconds, what it smells like is tequila. It smells like tequila, I swear to God. At first I thought it was like maybe like a DiSerono like smell, like liqueur, like um, uh, you know how Amaretto almost has this uh, spe specific liqueur smell. But the more that I, I sprayed the opening and the more I experienced tequila, it is absolutely a tequila like smell in the top. And then what ends up happening 10, 20, 30 seconds in, is it almost feels like you took that tequila note and you dipped it in oud. Okay, so imagine that you have tequila that has a cork in it. And I know tequila usually doesn't come with a cork, but let's say you have a tequila that does have a cork in it. You take the cork out and you smell the cork and you can still sort of feel the uh, presence of the tequila that sticks to the cork, right? Um, and imagine you take that cork and you dip it in one of these, well, that's not an oud oil, Imagine you dip it in one of these oud oils. This is actually Choco Barai oud that's used in the in the Russian oud, the one that gives it that chocolatey feel. It's a plantation um, Thai oud that was used in, in Russian oud. This is the actual oud oil itself. Um, so imagine you take it and you dip it in something like that, right? The cork of the tequila. So you sort of get a little bit of this liqueur um, feeling and... 
but immediately it starts mixing with things like cherry notes or pear notes. There's almost like this fruity pear or cherry that sort of comes to the forefront. That's why I was saying amaretto or di Sirono in the beginning. Um, and mix it slightly with just a little bit of blue cheese. Just a little bit, all right? This is not something that is like blue cheese overkill. No, just a little bit of animalic blue cheese. Um, a little bit of funk. And um, that little bit of funk, it probably sits somewhere in between something like um, Indonesian oud, which is, uh, I think, the least barnyard, and maybe something like Indian oud. So there's a little bit of funk in here, but not a lot. Not a lot at all. Um, and so uh, 30 seconds in, that weird tequila corky-like opening uh, tends to give way, all right? And so there's almost a little bit of this like mustiness that tends to uh, come to the forefront as well whenever you are, um, whenever you're smelling this, there's a little bit of this musty, murky corkiness, okay? And um, so what ends up happening is this fruity, like I said, cherry nuance tends to come forward, but nowhere near as smooth or cherry-like as the bits and pieces of Indian oud, the history of Indian oud. That one feels very, very smooth and cherry-like, right? Um, so this sort of a, a little bit less than that, and yet what tends to come forward as the hours tick by, like I said, I've got a nine-hour dry down here. So what tends to sort of... Um, tick come forward as the hours tick by is a little bit of this lava-like feel from the oud and it's very rare to I think to have that lava-like feel because whenever I smell something like Russian oud everyone talks about all oh, this very you know lava like um, you know flowing molten lava like feel but I think that tends to come from other ingredients not just the oud um, I think it tends to come from some of the, uh, there's some resinoids in here and, and labdanum especially. Labdanum gives off that very sticky uh, feeling. I think there's a lot of labdanum in Russian oud. And also things like um, oud zed, right? So if you've ever smelled oud zed and you have that lava-like feel, there's a little bit of that in, in, in the history of Bengal oud. But the history of Bengal oud, it feels like it emanates from the oud. That's the hardest part of it. When I smell Russian oud, or when I smell oud zen, sometimes it really feels like that sticky, resinous, sort of lava-like, flowing downstream feeling, that hot, molten bubbliness comes from the other resins. And I really love oud zen. Oud zen is uh, maybe top on my wish list right now of original Dory. The original oud zen, impossible to find, but top on my wish list. Um, and so it, what's so weird about the history of Bengal oud is how it really feels like that uh, lava-like feeling emanates from the the oud itself, right? And that makes it so different because as you're smelling it, yes, you are getting a little bit of that, uh, those resins, um, and, you know, they, they, they really do feel thick and somewhat leathery, but also in the background, you're getting this um, very, very smooth sort of woodiness, right? And, and it almost feels like along with the woodiness there's a little bit of maybe caramel or a little bit of butterscotch or you know something like that but the the sweetness is uh nothing like the synthetic sweetness that you expect to smell in a modern perfume nowadays nothing like that at all it feels like literally it's coming from the oud itself and the texture in the oud is so unique because it really feels like uh, whenever you're smelling the history of Bengal oud, as it continues to change, you're constantly reminded of these, um, you know, splintered wood chips, or you're constantly reminded of, I'll give you an example of what came to mind, and this may be sort of like a personal memory for me, but I think you'll understand where I'm coming from. So my uncle, um, who still owns this place, I believe, in Jamestown, New York, the Cherry Lounge in Jamestown, New York, look it up if you don't believe me. Um, they had this red sort of awning, right? Cherry, Cherry Lounge, right? So they had this red awning. And he also used to own a furniture store, right? Not a furniture store, a furniture manufacturing plant, okay? So he used to manufacture furniture. This is before China came about and like put them out of business 25 years ago, right? Um, and, and so he used to own this furniture store. And um, I remember going with him, getting a Cherry Lounge hat, right? And, and going with him and walking through this furniture manufacturer where they're like making legs for 
t tables and chairs and stuff like that. And so there's this sawdust feeling in the air of woodiness. And um, so there's this sawdust feeling in the air, right? And um, also almost this like lacord paint feeling, right? Um, and I just want you to imagine if you could just take both of those ideas and blend them together. Imagine like this red sort of cherry colored awning, right? That color blended with the smell of like the wood being sort of shaved and, and molded and sculptured, right? And then you get little like chips that fly off, you get little shavings that fly off. Uh, and then of course, maybe the paint, uh, the wood has to be treated with some sort of like paint, some sort of lacquer, right? And then you take all of that sitting inside of the furniture factory, listening to the sound of the tool, smelling the, you know, smell of freshly cut wood, and you add a fire, a little bit of a smoldering fire, but it's in the background. Kind of like if you've ever heard my uh, experience of smelling something like Fila Nagil by Serge Luton. You know how it smells like there's a fire, but the fire's kind of far away. It's not right in front of you. The fire is across the way. You can see there's a fire. You can see there's smoke, but it's far, right? Uh, that's the way that the smoke in the history of Bengal Oud smells to me. It really smells um, like you are um, smelling this blend of sort of wood chips, shavings, a little bit of maybe this cherry plum, uh, maybe even pear-like smell with the smoke in the background. And really, as the fragrance dries, what's interesting is, as the fragrance dries and that weird sort of tequila uh, liqueur opening gives way and allows sort of the woodiness to come forward, the smoke also comes forward. And so you would think if the smoke is infused in the top notes, you would get a huge blast of smokiness from the top. I don't. Um, I actually get more smoldering, burning, burning uh, vibe underneath as the hours tick by. Like right now, three hours in, this is the smokiest the fragrance smells to me. And um, as it goes on, it sort of continues like that until it just sort of fades away, fade, this fade into black, if you will. Um, and, and so it is a composition that is a joy to wear. It's probably easier to wear for most people who are newer to oud than something like the history of Chinese oud or the history of Indian oud because it doesn't have that big time animalic funk. And if you've ever smelled slowly burning oud chips, right? Uh, proper fire, uh, a proper, uh, the flame is, let's say, set to a proper uh, temperature, right? It's not super high. You're not, you're not straight up just absolutely incinerating the oud chips, right? It's like slowly uh, set. It releases its its smoke in, in sort of a controlled environment, right? And at the correct temperature. And there's this incense aspect to it, right? The incense floating in the air from the oud. That's a little bit of what it feels like into the dry down. And, and so for me, when you mix that strange sort of... Um, cork like smell which uh has a little bit of this i would almost say you know cork almost has a little bit of like this wet cardboard because you know cork all looks compressed and stuff like that right so there's a little bit of this cardboard uh particle board that's a good word for it it's almost a little bit of this particle board like smell so you have particle board with the cherries the plum the pears the fruitiness the smokiness the woodiness and a little bit of that animalic touch, just enough to sort of keep it interesting. That's the composition. So um, nowhere would I say this is my favorite of the collection at all, but I but I definitely think it deserves its its flowers. It deserves its love. It deserves to be recognized and talked about. And um, the fact that there's zero videos, excuse me, the fact that there's zero videos on this um, blows my mind. I mean, you know, there should be more people talking about this. And I understand it's a limited collection and all that stuff. But, uh, man, this is very, very good stuff. And uh, for an oud lover, it's really something to behold. I mean, I, um, I, I really feel like this is one of the top oud collections ever in my lifetime that I've got a chance to experience, especially since it just focuses on the oud. Like, people want to know what oud smells like. 
and there's all these different compositions and there's all these different ways to mix oud. You know, there's oud and coffee, there's oud and musk, there's oud and rose, right? There's oud and amber. There's all these different oud combinations, right? And so Russian Adam just said, you know what? I'm known for oud. Let me show you what oud smells like. And he said, here you go. And, and you know, going back to the um, founding of Ariz Ladori, what the house is supposed to stand for, he really wanted to bring forward these ingredients that the world is losing. You know, when we smell oud in a composition, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're not smelling oud. You're smelling whatever the modern Givaudan Simmerize product is, right? So for him, he wanted to sort of bring that to the population, bring that to the world. And what better way with the product that he is most known for, oud, than just for him to say, you want to know what real oud smells like? Here you go. Here it is. Here's real oud. Um, and so he did a hell of a job and balancing it with the perfumer's alcohol and having the correct, you know, blend and all that stuff. And what's funny is when you spray these, so let's say, say you spray history of Indian oud, then you spray history of Chinese oud, then you spray history of Bengal oud. They actually spray different. They, they sort of come out of the atomizer a little bit different because he had to weigh, you know, it's not all even. Some have a little bit more perfumer's alcohol, some have a little bit less. There's a very specific line that allows the oud to really shine in this composition. And I think he did a masterful, masterful job. This is one of my favorite um, Ariz Ladore collections because every now and then, kind of like today, out of the blue, and it usually comes out every three or four weeks, right? There'll be a day, I just want to wear oud. Like, I just want to wear oud. And you know what? As that's been happening... I haven't been reaching for many of the compositions or the NSARs or stuff like that. I've been reaching for this, stuff like this, out of this collection. Just want to wear oud. Um, and so it is a blessing. It's an honor to sort of get to know these. I know this is a very rare collection. I hope he can do another one sometime soon. I know he has a lot of very rare ouds in his collection, oud oils that he distilled himself and stuff like that. But um, the history of Bengal Oud, really enjoyed getting to wear this, do the video on it. If you have experience with this one or any of the, um, the history of Oud collection, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Appreciate everyone watching. Uh, thanks for everybody getting us to the 5,000 subscriber mark. I don't know if I'll do another, you know, celebration video now that we're getting up there and, and you know, subscribers and stuff like that. Maybe until we hit 10,000. But there has been a request to do the same setup I did for the 5,000 subscribers, where we do five niche and five designers for 5,000 subscribers for some of the other categories I didn't do in that video. So, for example, things like vetiver, citrus, oriental fragrances, stuff like that. Um, so I'll pick five more categories and we'll do that as well. And then that'll be the final celebration, I think. But um, if, again, if you have any ideas uh, for videos, I love hearing everyone's thoughts. I love the feedback. I uh, love interacting with everybody. So do leave a comment. Try to live stream one of these days very soon. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do a, a live stream very soon. Um, and, and appreciate everyone's support. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.